Okay. Shannon, how many people are we expecting? Um, I'm not, I'll, I will look, I'm not sure. 20 are here right now. I'll look and see okay. how many responded. So good morning, everybody. Get there. Okay, is this what everybody set up for? So if we can go around, let's go to the next slide. Uh, I'm wondering if I can click on it. No, probably not. So we're gonna go around the room just to make sure everybody knows each other. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about sort of the preference to the plan. And then we're gonna talk about the planning process and then we're gonna wrap it up. Hey, David. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Okay. So why don't we just go around this room? I would call out people's names, but the problem is our participant list switches as people talk. So you can never tell who you've, who you've called on before. So why don't we just go around the room and you guys introduce yourself and we'll get everybody who hasn't. So I'll tell you what, why doesn't David's on the top of my list right here? So why don't you start? Nice to be well, as long as I'm the list. Oh, <laughs> I'm yeah, David the one David. Center. Okay. Well, I'm a David too, so I'll go next, I guess. Perfect. Uh, Dave Fish, and I actually am starting today. I've been a service coordinator for a few years in outreach to the homeless, and I'm starting today officially as director of homeless services here at Reliance Health. Oh, great. Welcome. Thank you. I'll go next. I'm Bobby Joe Evans. I am the housing and outreach program manager for BH Care. Hey, Bobby Joe. Hi. Hey, Bobby Joe. Hi. Um, I'll go next. I'm Lisbeth De La Cruz, Columbus House in New Haven, Outreach Manager. Hey, Lisbeth. Great. I'm Myra Cavanas from BH Care Outreach Worker since February. Hello, Great. everyone. Hello. You started a tough time, huh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> huh. Hi, everybody. I'm Will Carpenter. I'm the manager for the PATH program up in Middletown for the Columbus House. Great. Hey, Will. Hi, everyone. My name is Katrina. I work for Perception Programs. I am uh, the lead for outreach, but I also oversee PATH. Great. Hey, Katrina. Hi, I'm Anna. I work PATH at Perception Programs. Great. Hi, everybody. This is Lori Walling. I work PATH out of Waterbury in Litchfield County. Hey, Lori. Hello. Hi, this is Laura Graham. Hi. Go ahead. Laura, oh, I think you just got muted. Okay. So Laura Graff from Reliance Health. I do oh. quality services. Great. And hi, I'm Marianne. I'm outreach for Bristol and Central Can. Hello, I'm April Maitland. I'm the program coordinator and I oversee PATH for Friendship Service Center. Great. Hi, hi April. Hi, Marianne. Hi. <laughs> Tara DeMeo, Director of Programs for the Friendship Service Center. Hey, Sarah. Did we miss it? Yeah, go ahead. I'm Carrie from Case Management at Perceptions. Hey, Carrie. Hey, Carrie. Hello. Hi, I'm Keisha from BH. Who do we miss? Well, I'll jump in there. I'm Elizabeth Zielik. I'm from the Bethel Center in Milford, and, I, and I'm their Outreach and Engagement Coordinator. Great. Zaneda, did you talk? Nope. Nope, it's Zanetta, but Zanetta Sasser with, no, that's okay. Um, Zanetta Sasser with CHR, um, I oversee PATH. Great. And Marianne? 
Marianne was here. She talked? Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, Marianne. Oh, Marianne Farr. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I'm from the Bristol and Central Can Outreach. Great. Right. We miss anybody? Shannon? Vera, did you talk? I just don't know if Vera said hi. I said hi. I uh, say it again if you need me to. <laughs> no, <you're laughs> Thank great. you. Sorry. Yeah, you're good. I think okay. that's everyone. All right. So good morning, everybody. Let's talk a little bit about service planning. Shannon and I would introduce ourselves, but we feel like you've seen all too much of us lately. So <laughs> we're happy to do that if you want. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about service planning and um, how it can guide the work with the clients that we serve and um, that it's a working document. And for the purposes of outreach, it's a pretty simple document. And the plan is, is developed from the ongoing assessment. And I don't want you to think about that long assessment that you're doing. I want to think about, I want you to think about the kind of assessments that you're doing when you see people every day. It's also based on client input and what their goals are. And the goals are really primary. And then it's also based on discussions with your team and your community resources, because I know none of you all of you coordinate with other outreach because the way the path is structured, you really have to. So it, it's trying to provide some structure for the work that you're doing with people as you're working with them directly and um, how to reach goals in the future. And for the purposes of this, though it's useful to do some sort of plan with everybody, we're really talking about the people that you're doing case management with. Okay. Let's go to the next one. So the planning process includes engagement and you guys know a lot about engagement. We're gonna talk about it a little bit, but we were expecting to hear from you some. Assessment and in the widest range of assessment, goal development and motivating people. So the key here, especially in outreach is to keep people engaged during this process. Cause we know that housing, the work to help people find housing or their next connection can be frustrating and that it can be frustrating for the people we serve and it can also be frustrating for the workers so the key to this is keeping people engaged and then we're going to talk about a simple plan and i'm saying simple not because either the people we work with or we ourselves are simple it's because it's the only way to do it in outreach it's going to be very simple okay let's go to the next one so engagement, you know about engagement, but the key to engagement for you all is engagement begins the first time you meet people and it also sets the tone for every other worker interaction in their future. So it's a huge thing that outreach does for people because you're the first person, sometimes the first um, person within the system that's tried to make their life better, right? So that initial connection is really important. And we're going to really focus on that. It begins at the first contact and it begins with a way of being with people, right? The way that you are with people and the things that you're teaching them in these early contacts are really important. It's being able to listen to people. It is, um, you know, looking them in the eye. It's um, offering them things that they need. It is working together to get small goals accomplished. It's also really listening to people's stories, why they came to us, why they're willing to talk, want. We're going to talk about all of those things when we go with people. We're not going to, we're going to evaluate each person. We're going to assess what they tell us. We're going to use our, you know, use what our, our observation is is if people obviously look distressed and they say, I'm fine, I don't wanna to talk to you, we're gonna think about that, right? We're gonna put that down. We're gonna make sure that we do that. We're gonna look at how they interact with their surroundings. We're gonna look where they live. We're also gonna observe stuff like, do they have a lot of stuff around them? Is it organized? How do they interact with other people in the encampment? Do they seem to have a role in the encampment? We're taking a look at what they're doing. We're going to evaluate each person. We're going to seek information from HMIS and other providers that have had interaction for these people. 
So despite popular opinion, you can begin to enter people into HMS without even their name. You do not need the full path assessment. Just put people into HMIS because we want to document the contacts, right? Because that's going to have a big effect of their housing. We also want to know where to have people. The other thing in engagement is the most important question is obviously listening to people, but the most important question we can ask is, you know what, when I come back, where can I find you? If you're not here, where can I find you? Because we're going to always set that up. And I know you guys are already doing that. Okay, let's go to the next one. So we want to be reliable. We want to show up at specific times. If we have a central place, like a lot of you all work out of soup kitchens or food pantries or even hotels, we want to make sure that we're there at a certain time so people can come to choose to see us as well as us going to see them where they usually go. We want to be reliable and we also want to be supportive. So that means listening to them, listening to them when we first do it, when we first come in. It's not starting with something, listening to them. We want to explain our role. What do we do? And I know that people see their role differently in different agencies. Some people see them as connecting them to the next thing. Some people see them as housing, as getting them housing. Talk about what your role is. We want to obviously listen. I know I say listen a lot, but that's really the most important part of our work. We want to figure out something to work on together, something simple, like even if it's a cup of coffee or getting somebody an extra blanket or helping people um, move to one place or the other or getting food from a food pantry. We want to work on something together that's simple and has a beginning and an end because we want to establish that this is a mutual relationship and how we work together. And this should include some tasks for the client and some tasks for the worker. We want to talk housing right from the beginning. <clears throat> when people talk about what they want, we want to connect housing to that. So our goal is to help people access, but also maintain housing. We're going to get to that. We're also going to look for some comfort or relief. People see us as a way to get out of an uncomfortable situation or feel more comfort. We're going to focus on that. So I did outreach for a long time. So let me give you an example. You got a guy, I had a guy whose feet were in bad shape and they clearly hurt him. He was also um, very psychotic, very psychotic and had a really hard time focusing. So what I thought I should focus on was the psychosis because that was clearly to me disturbing him. But you know what he wanted to focus on? He wanted to focus on his hurty feet. So with some help, I was able to focus on the hurdy feet. And you know what? We eventually got him some relief for the hurdy feet. And I could use that down the road to work on the psychosis. I don't want to pretend like because he accepted medical treatment for his hurdy feet that he was immediately willing to go to see a psychiatrist. Oh, yes, Andrea. I see the clear parallel between the feet and, my, and the voices in my head. No, it took a really long time but he felt some competency in working with people to help him relieve an uncomfortable symptom. So it was a process, but we were able to do that. So we wanna really look for things that relieve people, but that they perceive will give them some relief as opposed to things that we see with some relief. And I wanna be clear, I see, I mean, I think a lot, a lot of people with psychosis, not everybody, but a lot of people with psychosis are tortured by the psychosis. So that was always, it was meant to provide them relief, but that wasn't how we perceived it. So it's really important to listen to that and you give people a chance to work on things. And then we're building competency and confidence and we can work on the other things down the road. Okay, let's go to the next one. So we wanna think about, we are in the pre-housing stage, right? So we want to think about what are the tasks, and these are in no particular order. But if I was doing order, we want to identify people's goals and preferences. We want to think about what they want. We want to educate people on what might be available to them and the expectations of each. 
We want to find out where people came from, what their housing was like in the past, and what their homelessness was like, and what they did during a normal day, and what their roles were. We want to connect people to income as quickly as possible. We want to gather documents as much as we can. And I'm reading now is impossible, is very a long term process. It's not impossible, but it's a long term process. And if people were born outside of Connecticut, particularly in New York or Texas, it seems like, you know, you're pushing a rock up a hill. And we realize that. We want to assist people with a housing search. And you want to think about not necessarily, if you don't do that, that's fine, but you want to think about who's going to do this. So let me say again, this doesn't all have to be done by you. We also want to connect people with resources that will support housing stabilization, both treatment and supports. So we want to talk about those things and get an idea of them. Are we going to set up a path? No but we're gonna start and we're gonna talk about it, at least what people already have going for them. We're gonna make a housing stabilization plan. We're gonna teach people tenancy skills because tenancy skills refine people's expectations of housing because housing is always the goal. Living on the streets is always, not living on the streets is always the goal. And then we're gonna attain some, um, consent to work with the landlord because we've got to be able to monitor housing stabilization, not necessarily us, but somebody's got to do that. So this is what we're looking for, right? So we're going to talk through these things, but this is a list of tasks. For those of you, Will, David in particular, who've been trained in CTI, this is really reflective of the pre-CTI phase. How many people have been trained in CTI? You guys got emojis at the bottom, just put an emoji like a thumbs up or you can put it in the chat. Yep, okay. Three thumbs up. Okay. No, okay. So CTI is critical time intervention and it's a practice that's evolved around the transition from homelessness to housing. And it consists of actually four phases. One is pre-CTI, which I'm pretty much describing here, which is before people go into housing and what is required or what is needed to get people through that process. Phase one begins when people are going into housing and that's the adjustment to housing. And that's a very intensive stage. The third, second stage is, um, and it also includes a lot of resources. The second stage is readjusting the resources and pulling on those resources. And phase three is stepping people down to normal case management. So it's an intensive service that's meant to help stabilize people in housing. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, so a lot of people haven't been trained, okay. So we wanna develop trust. We wanna establish a structure for the relationship. The structure for the relationship should include some mutuality, should include us really seeing the value of each person's input and be aware that each person is the expert on themselves, whatever they can contribute and that we need their help to move forward. This is not all about what we can do for somebody, it's what we can do together. It's also not about what the person can do for themselves. It's what we can do together. It's, it's an opportunity to talk to what they bring to the table and talk about what's important to them and that we're sort of structuring it. So some of these things are around motivation, which is really important. Some of these around structure and purpose. Some of these forward. And um, we want people to talk. And I know people are frustrated because a lot of people feel like they have to fill out that big old form about assessment. Actually, what we really want you to do is have a conversation with people. You can uh, enter them into, HMIS, when you first meet with them, you get some credit for that. You, you want to put together the assessment as it 
unfolds and you want to put the information in the assessment from the conversations. You want to set the tone for future work and the tone is mutuality and respect. Okay, let's go to the next one. We also want to establish a working relationship. So we want to teach people what it's like to work with a case manager. So how many people have heard stuff like you do it? What I want you to do is get me a section eight voucher. Is this sounding familiar? We want to teach people how we work together. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at really small goals. As I said, a blanket, a cup of coffee, a food pantry, something like that, right? And as small things are achieved, confidence grows and trust grows. But a bit important part of that is debriefing the experience. So let's say it's as simple as getting people a blanket right? We make sure they get a blanket, but we don't want to set the tone that they say something and we get it for them, right? Hey, man, I was really, I, I, I really appreciate that you told me the things that'll make you more comfortable, that I appreciate the way that you asked for that. And these are some things that I have access to, Let's talk about other things that would make you more comfortable and who has access to those. And let's see if we can go through that together. It's a very simple conversation, but you see how the tone is shifted. We wanna make sure that people understand that we want them to express what they need and they want, and we wanna set the tone for working towards it together. We're also gonna talk about how home is a part of that right? Be a lot easier. You know, have you ever thought about maybe housing? One of the things that you've identified is it's cold outside and it's hard to get all the materials that you need to stay warm. Have you thought about housing? What would housing look like? It's not like we're going to offer people housing. We're going to ask them what it would look like for them. And I'll show you what we're building towards. Okay, let's go to the next one. So assessment is not an event, right? It unfolds over time. If you get all the information, mm, I, I don't know what that means. And you know what? Getting all the information in, in one sitting when you first meet people is going to set the tone for things are immediate. And we don't want to set the tone for that because things aren't immediate. We want to allow information to fold, unfold over time, over a conversation, and then fill out what we can. As the person experiences challenge and progress is made, the assessment will deepen. We'll have an idea about what their skills are. You want to update the, the, the assessment as often as you can, but if, it's, if you have some sort of system, most of you have electronic records where you can add things to the assessment as it unfolds over time, or even change things in the assessment, that's important. And remember that assessments aren't just self-assessments for the client. They're also developed through observation, conversation, consultation, and worker skills. So the things you see have to go into the assessment. Okay, let's go to the next one. One of the most important things to get in an assessment and to talk to people about is both their housing history and their homeless history. So I wanna put a caveat in this housing history. You wanna know the places people lived like the last five years. You wanna know their experience as a leaseholder. You're getting at what their expectations of housing are. And most people have either not had a lease or not had a landlord who consistently enforced and the, both the rights and responsibilities of tenancy, particularly the right. It's, was. You want to talk about what worked. And you know what? I often ask people, I, I, I often heard from people, every kind of housing experience I've had has been awful. Okay. Was there anything you liked about it? Anything? Well, I liked having a shower. Okay. So we got something there, right? We want to talk about that. We want to work, talk about what worked and what didn't. 
We also want to talk about their homeless history. And part of what we want to get is the initial episode of homelessness. But you know what? Don't sweat it. And the reason is we're not always going to get that right away because oftentimes the initial episode of homelessness or what made them homeless in the first place was a traumatic experience. And people are going to try to protect that, protect that feeling. So if we don't get it, we don't get it, right? We might get it eventually, but we don't want to push people on this. And one of the things is we don't want to open up people's trauma at that point because we want to help people seal up so they can move forward. And we're going to remember to come back to that. So if people want to talk about it, we'll definitely talk about it. But if people are resisting it, just, you know, let them go with that. Because oftentimes I remember people describing things like they lost everything when they first became homeless. Maybe they started using substances, their marriage broke up, they had a house, they lost their house, they had kids, they've never, they haven't seen their kids, they had a job, they lost that. And that it's, it's, it's traumatic. Do we eventually wanna know that? Yeah, because we wanna connect it, but relax, right? We don't have to get that. What we wanna talk about sort of things like how long they've been homeless, where they stayed, what they preferred, were they staying with other people, away from other people? Were they staying, were, did they ever stay in a shelter? If they stayed in the shelter, did they stay in a hotel? That's a new point of assessment now in the homeless history. They're willing to accept a hotel and not a shelter. Why is that? We want to know those things because those tell us what means things to people. We also don't want to know their routine, what they did during a normal day, how they got the goods and services that they needed, and what their supports are. And that's going to be really important. The people, you know, oftentimes homelessness is built on a barter economy. Homelessness period, even in hotels and even in shelters and certainly on the streets. And who helped them? And who did they help? We're going to go for skills and resources, but we're also going to go for what those connections are. And that they may have to replace those connections or they may want to maintain those connections. So those are all part of the rich, rich conversations that you have with people in that outreach period. Okay, let's go to the next one. So what I want you to do is turn on your cameras. If you can, if you feel like you're camera ready, if you feel like you're not, it's okay. And Shannon, put that up again. Put that up again? Yeah. All right. So we can put the questions in the chat, actually. Okay. So what I want to do is, sorry, I should have warned you about this. Can we divide people in groups? Um, yes. Okay. You want so, me to put the, wait, so you, you want me to put the questions in the chat? Put the questions in the chat. Yeah. And then we're going to divide people in groups and just have a conversation for like 10 minutes about what you're seeing in terms of housing history. Do the people you work with have experience as leaseholders? What's their experience? What kind of roles do people have while they're homeless? And how is housing success connected to people's personal goals? So just chat about it, talk about, think about people you serve and just, and you'll have access to the chat. So Shannon's gonna divide people in groups. Shannon, we could probably do four groups of five people. Okay. Families, what? families um, sleeping in cars. Yep. Um, untreated mental health. Yep. And, and everyone wants to go to a hotel. 
Ah, so that's interesting. So no, people aren't asked, they're asking for hotels, why? I don't know. We might want to ask them what what appeals to them about hotels or ask them to contrast shelters and hotels, right? I mean, I think it's pretty, hotels afford some privacy, particularly for families, right? They also, you know, they tend to be self-contained units. No, hotels are closing either. down in most regions, right? Yeah, I know in New Haven and the Valley and Shoreline, the, the line that we always get is, we were told by someone else right. that they're putting people who are homeless in hotels. And when you tell them, no, that's not the case, um, you know, and explain the process and you ask them why they wouldn't want to go into the shelter, they give the, you know, I don't want to be with other people. I don't want to be exposed to that stuff. I don't want, my stuff will get stolen. I'll get, I'll get bed bugs. I'll get this. Um, you know, but they, they want to go, they want that hotel experience. It's like a vacation to them. Okay. Um, but they hear it from other people on the streets that they're hoteling people. Of course. So that's the word. Of course. So one of the things is that we want to educate people about what's the story with hotels, right? And we want to start that before people even ask for hotels. Will they believe us? Maybe not. But we also want to talk about the fact that people definitely want to be inside, right? And they want to be, they want a self-contained unit. So they're identifying a housing preference, right? So we want to have that conversation. It's great that people are saying they want hotels. Great. Are they going to get them? Probably not, right? But that we need to provide that education and also talk about what are the opportunities they do have. And in fact, they could get into rapid rehousing fairly quickly, right? Bobby Joe, is that true in your area? <laughs> Somewhat. <laughs> How quick are hotels at this point before they close? Or are they closed? They're, they're, closed. they're pretty much closed. Yeah. They're pretty much closed. Okay. Yeah. But how quick was it when you had them going? Um, well, I didn't get to work with the hotels. We didn't, but I had I know some clients were in the hotels. Yeah. So, but as far as getting housing through the hotel or from the, being in the hotel, it, I mean it depends, it depends on each client situation. You know, right. It still depends on the client situation. Right. Um, the programs that were open, the willingness they had to work with people. Um, you know, it was just, it still depended. Um, we had a couple of clients we worked with that went to the hotels and were kicked out of the hotels because of their inability to be able to stay with a roommate because they still had to be paired up with roommates. Yeah. Um, in many instances. So it, so that's something we know, right? That's something we know. We want to build on that stuff. Would you, who wanted to say something? Sorry. I'd like to add something. Great. Um, hey, David. I mean, hotels were a necessity uh, uh, during the pandemic and to some extent still are. But boy, I am so done with hotels. Now, we're fortunate we have a shelter and uh, that's what we can offer. Uh, there's a short wait list as well. But I think the, 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 the upside of that is... Uh, I find with people in hotels, we're just not progressing. It's just hard to uh, yeah, yeah. maintain that regular contact. When they're at the shelter, they're here. So they're, they're more accessible. There's a little more structure um, and the services are here. And we, it's, uh, so I, uh, that's sort of how I talk about the shelter. I, I understand a, a people's reluctance, um, but, but there's an upside I think we sometimes, uh, I try to emphasize with people as well. Um, and, yeah, so, and, and honestly, some people, you know, their month in the shelter has really been a, a good experience. If we get them housed, if we do the things we, we you know, we try right. to do, people can get stuck in the shelter too, but our shelter staff is pretty aggressive about moving people forward. It's good. And I think that, I think that one of the problems with the hotels was they were thrown up from nothing, right? And there wasn't a lot of planning about how much services, they could have been intensive placement units, right? 
but instead they were a reaction to a crisis. And I think that that caused all sorts of problems. So we didn't get the infrastructure in by the time they closed. So David's point about hotels were a machine to get people housing, that would be a different thing. And we would sell the hotels differently, right? But I think that that is a way to sell the shelters and that if people are wanting hotels, they're telling us something about their preferences. And we can turn that into a housing preference and we need to talk to people about that. Because no matter where they go, they gotta be ready to talk housing, somehow talk housing, right? I also think that the expectations in hotels weren't as clear to everybody when it first happened, right? So you couldn't say, these are the rules in the hotels. Are you ready to follow these rules? Are you not ready to follow these rules? Is this the best option for you? You couldn't have that sort of critical thinking conversation because it was a crisis response, right? So we want to think about how we can have that critical thinking conversation about both housing and shelter with people. And yeah, shelters are tough right? You're around a lot of people and it's tough. And you've got a case manager that's following you around all the time. It's true, right? It was certainly true in my shelter is every time you turn around, there was somebody saying, what are you doing? What do you, what's next? You know, the whole thing. So that it, 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 there, it, and that can be uncomfortable for people, but we want to talk to talk to people about that's part of the housing process. So we want to explain that. Did you guys talk about what people do and what their roles are when they're in housing, when they're in homeless? No, you don't have anybody that keeps a bunch of stuff so they can give it to somebody if they need it, or that the role of the mother with the, with the kids, it's usually a mother, it could be parents with kids in a car and how they manage that, how they manage school, how they manage other things. How the hell do they manage work? Mary yeah. Ann. Marianne talked about some. Marianne, are you willing to oh. share what you said about this? about the uh, bottle and bottles and cans or um, the? Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, the yeah. Yeah, there's a, a bunch of um, different groups here in New Britain, especially. Um, they go about you know hunting for bottles and cans, and they have different areas that they yeah. do that. Then they all get together and they uh, go and um, have them you know cash out. Yep. And yeah. And, and then there's one guy, he's got a pretty elaborate encampment that he had for himself. And uh, there's like a generator out there. He's got a shower and, you know, a couple of rooms and some stuff made out of wood. And he's not homeless anymore, but he still has that for other people to use that are, you know, all um, right. So he's still yes. connected. He's still connected to being homeless, but also the bottles and cans are an interesting thing. How could they continue that bottles and cans thing once they're housed? Landlords don't like it when you bring bottles and cans into the apartment, right? You ever had right. anybody who brought buckets of bottles and cans in and then you get all sorts of vermin and stuff like that? Yep. Yep. A lot of so, times. But they have a central place. Can they keep that central place? Can they keep working their bottles and cans business for a while? while they're housed, or are you gonna take that away? They can keep working it as long as they don't bring it to their house, right? Uh, right. So that's a conversation we wanna have. You know, you could keep this. Right. How about that guy? Why did the guy who had the whole, the, the condo in the woods, right? With the shower and everything else. <laughs> yeah. How did he decide to get housing? Um, well, he he was getting help and uh, he got matched with rapid rehousing. And yeah. then he ended up getting married. Ah. So, yeah. So he's all set and he's still helping. I think he takes his his uh, kids out there for like um, camping too. Okay. Yeah. For a getaway. But I know many times there were people that were really in a bad situation and um, had nowhere to go and he had helped them out. Okay, but you know what? There's two things about this. One is he wanted to get married or he got a girlfriend and that's what convinced him to come inside, right? Yeah. He wanted a different kind of life and that's a really important thing. That's the linkage <laughs> to housing, right? Yeah. It's okay. 
Okay. David's going to a lease meeting. That's good. So it's important to think about these things, about how they did it and why people have made the transition before so we can help people make this transition. And I would get this guy to tell his story. That's how we can help some people is tell his story to other people you're working with. Right. Makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. These are great. Okay, Shannon, let's go to the next one. Part of this is identifying what people's preferences are. And we're gonna send you this preference sheet, but if we go to the next slide, I'll show it to you. It's a slide for people to talk about their preferences, but it sets you up to negotiate it. And we wanna talk about, and this was from Bobby Joe's comment, is that people decide on one thing, that's a crisis decision, right? What do you want? I want a hotel is they're unable to focus on anything else because they're very reactive. And we need to help people to think about critically what they want. It's a sheet that you can use with people. So it, it covers things like location, um, size of apartment, um, and people are gonna be all over the map with this. Well, I want a three bedroom. Okay, you're by yourself. How are we gonna get you a three bedroom, right? But what you want them to identify is where they are now, what their ideal is, and it might be that they're working towards a three bedroom, but what would they accept now? Maybe they would accept an efficiency and if we can show them how that would get to the final goal. So it's a way to have a conversation. Want to talk to them about, you know, do they want to be near the encampment? Do they want to be far away? Do they want to be near workers? Do they, you know, do they want to live in a place where their service is on site? What are the advantages and disadvantages of that? What about an elevator? What about cooking facilities? What about shared amenities? What about pets? We want to have this conversation with people and talk about where they are now, what they have now, what their ideal is, which turns into long-term goals, and what's negotiable and not negotiable. And we wanna have this conversation with people. It gives us a way to focus. We also wanna have the conversation about nobody gets everything they want, right? But that you can compare it like, you know what? We just saw this apartment or we've been talking about this apartment and it has a couple of your goals. I know they've had a really hard time, you know, getting apartments in, I don't know, where's a fancy area where you live, right? They've had a really hard time getting people housed in this place because of the rents are so high. But you know what? This other place has some of the same amenities that you talked about. It's near some sort of transportation. You can get a house with cooking facilities. You can, you know, these are things, you know, you can get some outdoor space. Maybe there's a laundry in the neighborhood. You can get certain adaptations. So you can talk about it in preferences in terms of weighing each over the other. Is this something you feel like you might use? Okay. Great. Hi, Shannon. Is there something, is this something you feel like you might use? Preferences sheet? No? Okay. All right, let's go to the next one. It's a way to negotiate with people. You also want to educate people on the lease. What I don't know, when I was doing outreach, what people most focused on is housing pay, you have to pay rent. And yep, you do, right? But what do you get in return? So one of the things is allowing people peaceful enjoyment. What's that mean? How are things have to change? You know, it may mean there's no noise after 10 o'clock at night, or you can't play your TV loud enough, you know, that it can be heard outside. But the advantage is you have a TV. You have to pay rent. Why do you have to pay rent? Well, because, you know, these are the things and that, you know, one of the things that you said you wanted eventually was a three bedroom apartment. And frankly, if you pay rent and you get a landlord notice, there's a chance you might get a bigger apartment. What's keeping it free of hazards? We're going to deal with stuff at this point. How much stuff can you have in housing? What are the rules around that? Can you move people in? No, because this is your apartment. What are the reasons for that? After a certain amount of time, people get lease, get, get, get put on the lease or get tenancy rights. 
So that means they have equal rights to the apartment as you do. This is really your apartment. So what are we worried about? And how can you add people to the lease? This guy got married. Can you add him on marriage? Yes, even with a subsidy. But these are the requirements. So just give people something to think about. What's criminal activity? What are the reasons that you wouldn't smoke weed in the common areas? Well, there are a lot of reasons for that, right? So we talk about that. We also go up, Shannon. We also go to the next one. Yep. Next one. Yeah. We also want to talk about people's rights. They have a right to privacy. In fact, the landlord, even though they have a key, can't enter your apartment except for under very specific circumstances. One is with permission and the other is there's a housing emergency. And we'll define those emergencies. And then they have to let you know they were in there. They can't just come into your apartment, even though that might've been their experience with past landlords. They have a right to safety. They have a right to repairs. We're gonna teach you how to get repairs. You don't have to live in shit basically, right? And that you have a right, well, my last landlord, the door was, front door was broken and drug dealers used to congregate. Okay, that's, that's something the landlord's responsible for. And we can help you advocate for that. You have a right to a safe apartment. So you want to have that conversation. You have a right to due process. My landlord told me to get out last time. I hate that. I can just be thrown out at any time. Actually, you can't. And let's talk about what that means, right? There are very specific reasons you can be thrown out. There's a process, you can address it at everything. You wanna have these conversations casually as part of it, as part of the prep for housing, both the rights and responsibilities so people can make an informed choice. So we've got the preferences, the rights, the responsibilities. Let's go to the next one. Here are some resources for tenancy education. We may want to give people the Connecticut rights. I realize giving people paper is always a tricky thing, right? But you want to, you know, maybe go through it with people, leave it with people. Um, there's also a RentWise workbook that's been very helpful. You can download it for free. And this is a way for people to prep for meeting landlords and also understand basic rights and responsibilities. So these are some resources for you. Okay, let's go to the next one. We wanna work from people's own experience and you guys have a really good idea of what people's experience is. I can tell that from the conversations. You also wanna elicit and talk to the person and reflect back and clarify and check their understanding. I know you want a hotel. These are the reasons you want a hotel. Would housing fit that same bill? There's a right to privacy. Let's talk about the rights and tenancy. You wanna connect things to their longer term goal. You also want a goal set. I'm gonna talk a lot about goal setting. You wanna empathize about nobody thought they'd be in this position at the age they're at. And that goal setting often brings up a lot of loss for people. And you wanna empathize with that and make sure that they know you understand that. And you wanna talk about moving forward. You want to listen to the person's perception of past successes and struggles in reaching goals and identify skills, even if they didn't completely meet the goal. You want to talk about things like persistence and things that they'll need to get housing. You want to talk about their skills in terms of negotiating, in terms of meeting landlords. You want to identify skills that they've, that they've talked to you about and they've also shown when they're homeless and link them to housing. You want to discuss their strengths and you want to talk about how that might help people reach goals. Okay, let's go to the next one. So we also want to ask people what, what they want their life to look like. And that's really hard when people are in a crisis and it limits people's ability to think long-term. So we want to talk small. We want to start small. We want to let people dream a bit. What's their ideal? Bobby Joe said, I just want a hotel. Okay, so what's the hotel? What would they accept? You want to frame questions as goal statements. Instead of asking how much money they spend on different things, ask them how much money they think they need in housing and be prepared. People may tell you $100,000. That's great. 
right? Now we have a long-term goal. They wanna increase their income and they want housing. You wanna know what they wanna use it for and figure out how we can integrate that into the plan so they think they can get some of those things once they move into housing, even before they make that $100,000. Basically 700 year goals are fine. They tell you what people want. You wanna identify what's negotiable and what's not, what people will take, what are steps. And remember those 700 year goals, like I wanna make $100,000 a year, though it's possible for some people, you gotta take the first step. And we're gonna help people take the first step. We are not assuming that where we're moving people to from an outreach team is gonna be their last step. It's the first step towards getting what they want. And we're gonna ask them when they tell us what they want, right? Have you asked people about goals? And we're gonna ask them so that, right? You know, in Miami Beach, and I asked this guy what he wanted. And he said, housing. And he said, and he was surrounded by beer cans and clearly loaded, right? And he said to me, and I said, oh, okay. So what do you think about housing? He said, well, if I get housing, I'll, I'll stop drinking. Did I believe that? No, right? But the other part of that is why did he think in order to get housing, he could stop drinking? In fact, he needed to understand what the options were. And though I wanted him to stop drinking, that wasn't the goal. The goal there was really what he wanted was housing and what he thought he'd have to give up was clear. So I am at, I asked him, once you get housing, what happens? He said, well, I won't have an alcohol problem anymore because I'll be housed. Is that true? No, but it's clear he thought he had an alcohol problems. So it's something we could work on along with the housing, right? But we could acknowledge one as a longer term goal and one as a shorter term goal. So we're gonna try the so that principle. So let's go to the next slide. So we're gonna divide you in groups, smaller groups, just like before Shannon. And whoops, I left veterans in here. We're gonna share goals that your clients are setting or a goal that you're setting, right? Can be your personal goal. Shouldn't be too personal, right? You don't wanna have this conversation in a, in a, in a training, like I'm trying to decide whether to have a baby. So that you wanna share goals that the clients are setting or that you're setting. So simple goals, not too personal. And ask people this so that. What are things you want? So think New Year's resolutions. I wanna eat healthy and ask the so that thing. In other words, I wanna eat healthy so that what happens? And what it does is opens up other paths to the goal but it also tells you what are people's expectations once they do it. So think about this, okay? A lot of times when people move into housing, there's a period of time where they're shocked that they didn't get the things that they wanted when they got housing. They thought if they worked towards housing, they would get a job immediately. Do you get a job immediately in housing? No. Do you increase your income immediately? No. But those are things that we could have started working on much earlier if we knew what they wanted. So we want to ask the so that principle. I want this so that what? So I want one person to be the worker, one person to be a client. As I said, it can be your personal goals or it can be one that's identified with a client and ask the so that principle. Ask why, right? What will happen if you reach that goal? Try it out. So take about 10 minutes. You know what? Take about five minutes, actually, because we're coming towards the end. Take about five minutes and try it out in your group. So we're going to, the, the questions are in the chat, and we are going to divide you into groups. So Shannon's going to do that, and you got to click on okay. that. Okay. All right.
Did it broaden the conversation at all? Sorry. No? Is this something you might use? Can you see any advantages to it? No one. Okay. Oh, I'll comment. <laughs> Good. Thank you. I think there's a hard. I think these are hard conversations because, yeah, as you said, people are so uh, uh, sort of just so preoccupied with getting by day to yes. by day. How can they think beyond that? Yeah. And and a goal they might have, uh, um, uh, the, the the there may be a goal, but the 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 real conversation, of course, is the steps to get there and how do you begin those steps? As as you know, as you've often, as you've often said, and maybe this is where um, you know motivational interviewing can be helpful as well to sort of absolutely move that move the conversation forward from just yes. sort of having a dream, which is good. Uh, just thinking and say, so what, what is something we can do now, this week to do that? But that's not, that's just really hard for folks, you know? It I mean, is hard takes... for folks. And I think that oftentimes, let's say it was a, let's say it was a hotel. I want a hotel. Okay. What do you imagine will happen once you get in the hotel? And oftentimes people have no idea, right? So that sometimes it's, it doesn't mean that they don't, we're not working towards the goal that they identified, but we're also trying to figure out other things that we can do, which is what you're saying, is figure out the steps to the other bigger goals. So we can do both short-term and long-term, but it's really tough. And yeah, it's trying to get people off that dime of, this is the only answer to my problems. This is what all my buddies are saying, and this is what I want to get. And why don't you want to give it to me? And it, but it's part of broadening out that conversation. It's just one tool, but you're right. You're right. It's tough to get people off of that. It is motivational interviewing. Let's talk about that for a minute. Shannon, did you want to say something? No. Okay. Let's no. go to the next one. We wanna talk about these things. These are going towards steps and goals, rights and housing, expectations, rent payment. What are the expectations? What are the financial realities? What are the process and timelines? Let's go to the next one. And we wanna turn this into focused planning, right? So a plan that you do doesn't have to have more than one goal. And it can be the first goal that they, that they talk about, but it's gotta be, it's got to focus on the impressing needs that impact housing access, and it's got to relate something to the long-term goal. So we want you to have a conversation about it. And also remember, longer-term goals require connection to resources. So it provides a little motivation for people to connect to these resources, because a big part of what you're doing in outreach is connecting people to the resources that are going to sustain them in the future. So let's go to the next one. So one of the things that we want to do is we want to use some parts of motivational interviewing or motivation for change. And we want to always recognize competence. We want to identify skills that'll help people and how they can transfer those to housing, even if, or accessing housing, even if it's things like how they manage other people in the encampment. What does that have to do with it? It can talk about, you know, quiet enjoyment and managing your neighbors and you're good at this. Talk about what their skills are. You wanna also rank the importance of their needs and you wanna reflect information that's heard to affirm it's heard. And that's usually the start of the conversation. You wanna restate what people are saying to make sure that we understand what it is. And we wanna address barriers that we wanna address in the context of goals, right? Maybe you want to get your kids back. You want a relationship with your kids. What would help with that? Is it housing? Is it employment? Is it money? What are the things that will help do those things that you want? And it's also acknowledging choice and always trying to explore one more option. We never, we want to 
get people off this reactive thing where they pick one option. If we can just introduce two options, that's a huge, that's a huge success. Let's go to the next one. So how do you have the conversation? And this is what David is saying, right? Oftentimes when we're talking about what might be barriers to goals, people have no awareness that it's a problem. Part of that is helping put it in context, but part of that is raising questions. This is taken from stages of change, which teaches you how to work with people before they're in the action stage, before they're ready to make a change. So it's things we can do to raise people's awareness. And one of them is asking questions. Everybody know what peer contemplation is? Here's what it looks like. I want housing, you need to get me housing. Okay. So let's talk about housing and let's talk about what you need to do to get housing. I'm not doing anything, this is your job. <laughs> Okay, what are we gonna do? We're gonna ask questions. We're gonna ask questions about their history in housing. We're gonna ask questions about, you know, what are the things they need to accomplish? We're gonna ask questions about if they've been able to accomplish them before, just to raise the awareness of why. We're gonna also ask questions about, there's no such thing as a free lunch and you're gonna to have to do things to get housing. Contemplation, people are aware of the issues that are doing it. They're considering change. We wanna do the pros and cons of trying different things, like maybe a shelter or maybe a hotel or maybe going to SSI or maybe applying for benefits. As people are in preparation, they're making plans. This is where we really wanna reinforce options and strategies to work towards the goal not right we're we're not getting people to work on one thing we're getting people to look at different options and making them just in deciding on the options that they try based on their own values this is where we really are emphasizing choice as people change behavior we want to support them and we want to also do relapse prevention. And the biggest relapse prevention in outreach is it takes a long time to get housing and people often lose interest. And they feel like if they don't get what they want right away, that it's not worth to change the behavior and the behavior is more comfortable for them. So we wanna always support people and talk about what they're doing to move forward. As people reach maintenance, we're gonna look for new goals. Goals provide people with structure and a reason to change behavior. And then we're going to do some relapse and we're going to assess this relapse prevention. We're going to assess the stage and we're going to re-engage. Is this making sense? Okay, let's go to the next one. Here's an important one is that I swear to God, I took veteran out of here, but I don't know what happened, but um, <laughs> it, it is a handoff to housing or a handoff to the next service that people get. So sometimes the next service is a shelter and you're going to do a handoff to the case managers in a shelter. Sometimes it's to a hotel. You're going to do a handoff to the case managers in a hotel if there are any. But most of the time it's housing. So you're going to let them know what people know. They know something about their rights and responsibilities. They know something about their options. They're considering rapid rehousing but I feel like they really need supportive housing, but they may not need to try rapid in the beginning. You also want to talk to the person about what they can expect from their next worker and how's follow-up gonna be handled. So in other words, you wanna have a conversation with the next worker and the person to talk about what the worker's gonna pick up and what they can continue. It helps define the role of the next worker and it helps define your role. You wanna meet with, you wanna meet with a new team or the new people that are gonna pick up this person and you wanna introduce this person and talk about the work that you've done together. You want people to think evaluatively about the work you've done together and how they can apply those skills to the next thing. It's a motivational interviewing skill. It's about competency and feeling confident. You wanna be available. As an outreach team, oftentimes people are connected with you forever. That's not a bad thing. 
You're the first person that really offered them some assistance. You've got a relationship with them and you need to decide in your agency if you're willing to meet with them in their new place, wherever it may be, and meet with them and their worker and visit them, especially in housing. And then we need to agree to consult because everything is not going to be in the warm handoff and everything is not going to be in the everything is not going to be in the paperwork. You need to have the worker feel free to call you and talk about how they're trying to work with somebody on something and if you have any ideas. You need continuity. Yeah, David. That's great. Um, in our situation, our job roles are fluid as they are yes. in many places. Yes. So I've had situations where I was the uh, the path worker and then transitioned into being the case manager in their rapid Which is housing. great. Is that any pro, pros, cons you'd want to mention? Yes. Um, actually, CTI is actually designed. So it's one worker who does the pre-housing work and the worker. Um, but in most places, you don't do that, right? So that's a real advantage. And then you don't need a warm handoff. However, as one phase of the work, as one phase of the work, like the pre-housing work and you transition to being their housing worker, you wanna give them a chance to reflect on the work together, the skills that they built and make a plan for the new work. So you wanna use some of the things in the warm handoff, only you're handing off to yourself. And that's actually a great way to do it. It's not possible in some of these teams, but it's a great way to do it. So that what you guys have done is integrated the path work, separated it, but integrated the path work into an overall teamwork, which, 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 is, which is we're at across the board. That's not everybody, but that's a great way to do it. And that's actually what the original CTI was based on. Actually, the original CTI was based on shelter workers working with people in housing. So they did all the pre-CTI work and then they moved people into housing and they followed them for nine months. And that was a great system. But we can do it any number of ways, but that's why we've added the warm handoff. Somebody put something in the chat. Oh, no. Okay. Anybody else have a comment about this, the warm handoff? Is this something you're doing? Just put a thumbs up or a thumbs down. You doing the warm handoff or are you continuing to work with people? Is this something you're interested in? Elizabeth said yes. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, the chat's not recorded. No, no, the video, just because it's getting close to 1130. Yeah. Okay. Keep going quickly. I'm going to close it up. So service planning. It's part of the process. We're really working on service planning right now. It's got to have a connection to the person's goals and it's got to give you a concrete way to move towards them. And it's a mutual document. So I'm going to close up. I'm going to thank everybody for coming. Thank you for your participation. I know these are not always easy and they're taking time out of the precious. You've got a lot of work to do. I realize that. But I just want to say what a pleasure it is to working with you guys. And we'll follow this up in the individual meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks. Thank you.